Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to this meeting of the Audit and Performance <coughs> Committee of the Perth and Kinross Integration Joint Board. Um, I'll first ask the clerk if he could um, outline the apologies and substitutions that we have this morning. Uh, thank you, Chair. We have apologies from Bernie Campbell and from Pat Kilpatrick, but we have uh, Mr. Bob Benson um, substituting for Pat Kilpatrick. Thank you, Clark. Um, moving on to item two, can I ask members if there are any declarations of interest um, regarding any of the items of business before us today? No, thank you. Um, if we move on now to the minute of the previous meeting, specifically the minute of the meeting of the Audit and Performance Committee, which was held on the 16th of September 2019. Um, are members happy that this is an accurate record of that meeting? Yes, I think actually it's only <laughs> me who is here. I'm sorry, I wasn't present there. So I'm going to have to say that it's an accurate record. <laughs> Um, of the meeting and just once again to thank committee services for the um, more detailed minutes um, for the audit and performance committee I think that's really helpful um, giving everyone um, a reference going back about the questions that were asked um, in slightly more detail um, welcome to Miss Campbell um, okay, are we happy to agree the minutes then bearing in mind that I was the only person there yes okay thank you um, if we move on now to item 3.2, which is the um, action point update. Um, Chief Officer, do you want to give an update on the first one? Thank you, Chair. So just to confirm that um, representations have been made to the Chief Executives of both Perth and Kinross Council and NHS Tayside in respect of the uh, risk sharing agreement. Uh, at the moment, the intention is that the current arrangements will continue uh, until such times as those chief executives can further discuss whether or not we can move to a more proportionate risk sharing agreement. But at the moment, we continue to be in the position where uh, any overspends in respect of funding provided by Perth and Kinross Council uh, or services delivered by Perth and Kinross Council will be borne by the council at the end of the financial year and similarly should we be overspending in the context of our budget in relation to health provided services uh, the current arrangement is that NHS Tayside would bear the responsibility for any overspend that's as far as we progressed uh, that particular uh, discussion but uh, both chief executives are very aware that there's a keen keenness to move to a position where we do move uh, to more of a proportionate share. Thank you. Do members have any questions on the risk sharing agreement? No? Okay. The second um, action point there was the committee um, asked me to write to the Chief Executive of um, NHS Tayside and Perth and Kinross Council um, regarding the money that Perth and Kinross Council allocated um, for um, the development of uh, further intelligence to inform service transformation um, which uh, there was £250,000 committed from the council side um, and that was dependent on match funding for NHS from NHS Tayside. Uh, my letter is there on page 17 um, and the response from uh, the two chief executives from the council and NHS Tayside is there on page 18. Are there any questions on that? Okay, um, more generally, can I ask if there are any other matters arising from the minute of the last meeting? Okay, um, if we move on now to item 3.4, which is a membership update from the clerk. Um, Chair, just to update that there are still um, you know, some vacancies on the committee um, and it's hoped that at the next full meeting of the IGB um, we would uh, in a position to appoint a further voting member um, from NHS Tayside and we're also looking into a further non-voting member on the committee. So the position at the moment is that we don't have a full quota of members and hopefully we'll be able to deal with that in due course. Okay, thank you for that update. 
Um, if we now move on to um, item four, governance and assurance, and the first item under this section is item 4.1, which is the internal audit progress report. Um, and I'll ask the chief internal auditor to speak to this report. Thank you. Uh, thank you, councillor. Um, 4.1, the main body of the report, uh, highlights the, the, the progress that internal audit has made since the previous um, committee meeting. All assignments from prior years are now complete and the, um, the last two reports are on the agenda today uh, as appendices to uh, report uh, 4.1. Um, scoping has been uh, completed for the assignments within the, the current year's audit, uh, audit plan and um, work has commenced on these uh, with a view to completing them uh, in time for reporting to the next um, meeting of the, uh, of the committee in June. I'm happy to take any questions uh, on, the co on the copying paper at this point. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions on the internal audit progress report? Mr. Benson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for the report. Um, and I noticed in the um, Appendix 2 um, of the report, there is a suggestion around risk maturity assessment on risk management arrangements and the suggestion of a risk management champion at board level. Can you say a bit more about how you would, um, how, how that role might be developed and what's the kind of vision for it? Because I think it's a very helpful suggestion. I just wonder if what more thoughts you've put behind it. Chief Internal Auditor. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, looking at the individual uh, assignments, um, the risk maturity assessment report as a whole um, was there to provide additional assurance and it was a bit more of a consultancy style approach. You'll notice from the report that there's, there's no overall conclusion on the overall uh, strength of control um, because of the nature of the work that was undertaken. Um, so the uh, uh, and the action plan was to develop, um, the, the agreed action was to develop an action plan which um, the Chief Finance Officer has been taking forward, of which that particular suggestion is being taken forward as part of that action plan. Uh, uh, we've had discussions about what that action plan looks like um, and the Chief Finance Officer is, is, uh, is looking at all aspects of the suggestions from within this to fully embed um, and grow the risk maturity within the organisation. I don't know if you want to say any more at this point about that particular role, Jane? Uh, no, we've had pre preliminary discussions around exactly what you asked, Bob. What, what um, is the, how would we best serve the um, recommendations that are being made? Um, and further discussions are planned, including um, Erica, Eric Drysdale as chair, with Callum and Gordon, just to make sure that we get that right, that we, we hit the right spot in terms of that risk champion. Okay, thank you. And I think that certainly I'm supportive of appointing uh, someone to that role, and I know that um, the, the, the chair of the IGB is as well, but probably the most appropriate place for that decision to um, happen would be at the, the board itself, obviously, in consultation with the chair and the vice chair. Mr. Benson. I think it's very helpful. I th thank you very much indeed, Chair. I think that that would be very useful to bring some form of proposal to, to the board. Uh, and it may be useful to use some of the IJB members to actually help to inform that as well, over and above the group you already have, if I may. Thank you. Um, the Chief Officer would like to give an update on clinical care and professional governance, which is um, Appendix uh, 3 of the report. Thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to uh, ensure that members were appraised of some of the developments that have, that have ensued uh, the, since the publication of this report. This report um, highlights a number of areas where we have to uh, concentrate our efforts to improve the resilience and, and the robustness of our approach to clinical and care governance. Uh, for that reason, it's a, it's a welcome report, albeit some of the issues that are raised uh, are clearly significant and uh, require our attention. However, members will hopefully be assured by, uh, by the update I'm, I'm about to give. So 
in response to the publication of this report, I uh, felt it necessary to commission one of my service managers to carry out a review of our approach to clinical and care governance. Um, it was also precipitated by uh, the need for us to ensure that we have clarity uh, about the role of the intended care governance committee of the IGB um, and further to ensure that the uh, integration scheme that underpins our work is being adhered to and complied with. I did have some concerns when I revisited the integration scheme about how robustly our arrangements were delivering on the intended uh, ambition of, of the integration scheme. Uh, also, there's a development across Tayside called Getting It Right for Everyone, and we wanted to ensure that the developing work that we're doing here in Perth and Kinross uh, very clearly aligned with the work that is being advanced across NHS Tayside. So that review has now been undertaken. Maggie Rapley, the service manager responsible, has reported to me. I have circulated the report to members of the executive management team. I've received some comments back, and we will be discussing it further uh, this Thursday at our uh, management team meeting with the intention of then bringing forward um, some proposals uh, around how we would re revise the current arrangements uh, how we would more robustly support the work of the Care and Professional Governance Forum and how we would then be able to move forward and support the professional representation to advise the Chair of the Clinical and Care Governance Committee. That was uh, a decision that the IGB took some time ago and which we haven't yet enacted and we need to progress. Um, I've also got uh, detailed feedback in relation to each of the recommendations from Jackie Pepper, the Chief Social Work Officer, uh, who is the co-chair of the, the forum uh, in relation to the audit report. And Jackie sends her apologies that she's not able to be here today. Um, in terms of recommendation one, the information I've just given you about the review, I think probably begins to address that recommendation. Uh, and we'll need to look at how we bring forward some formal report to either this committee or the IGB in due course. Um, in terms of recommendation two, uh, we have um, updated the template for reporting to the Clinical and Care Governance Forum, uh, and this has improved the quality of reporting and provided greater confidence in identifying service risks and assurance about how these are being managed. Recommendation three has, has been overtaken by the revised terms of reference which have been produced. Uh, and since August 2019, reports have been received by the Clinical and Professional Governance Forum in relation to adult support and protection, public dental services, South Locality, Perth Locality, Access Team, the Mental Health, o health Officer Team, and Prisoner Healthcare. Um, just for the benefit of the clerk, I will provide you with this note so you don't need to take all, all the details. Um, one of the significant challenges that we're experiencing is around the recommendation that says that we have su insufficient expertise, capacity or capability on the cl clinical and professional governance forum in relation to our hosting arrangements for inpatient mental health services. Um, this is recognised, it's something that I wrote to the Associate Medical Director of Mental Health Services in NHS Tayside about on the 21st of November. Um, he has indicated that this is something that he would wish to support, but personally won't be in a position to because of the, the pressures on his time, only working uh, two days a week. So what he suggested is it might be possible to commission external support, um, albeit that might be limited to a, a desktop review rather than attendance at meetings. So that probably wouldn't be the route that we would wish to pursue. Um, he's otherwise suggested that we look elsewhere in Tayside at someone who could provide that clinical and professional advice to the forum um, from a psychiatric background in relation to the reports that will come forward in relation to inpatient mental health. Um, probably worth noting though that uh, there are some wider considerations that we will now need to take into account. Uh, I'm specifically referencing here the publication two weeks ago of the independent inquiry into mental health services in Tayside. Um, colleagues, members who have had the opportunity to review that report, and many of you will have uh, in the context of the discussions that we had at last week's IJB, will note that there are probably three recommendations uh, therein that directly have uh, a relationship to, to the discussion that we're having. 
Recommendation 5 suggests that NHS Tayside with partners needs to review the delegated responsibility uh, for hosting uh, for inpatient mental health or for mental health services generally, as well as to formally review the hosting arrangements um, that give the responsibility at the moment to Perthink and Ross IJB for, for hosting mental health services. Clearly, clarity about responsibility and about the hosting arrangements will have a bearing on issues to do with clinical and professional governance. However, recommendation nine in the independent inquiry report also highlights the importance of clarifying the responsibility for the management of risks at both the operational and strategic level. Uh, and I think that probably also has a bearing on the work of uh, the clinical and professional governance forum and committee. Um, what I would say though is that as the chief officer, uh, along with the relevant officers who are in the mental health leadership team, I do take reports in relation to risks associated with inpatient mental health to the Cl Clinical Quality Forum of NHS Tayside, to the Care Governance Committee of NHS Tayside, and to the Strategic Mis Risk Management Group of NHS Tayside. Um, so, you know, there, one of the considerations that I think that we've raised elsewhere and, and began to look at is the, is the importance of ensuring robust governance, but uh, avoiding the situation where we've got layers and layers of duplication. So, I think there's something that we need to consider in that context. The third recommendation in relation to the independent inquiry that has some relevance perhaps is the, the need at recommendation 45 for NHS Tayside to pr prioritise the recruitment of a permanent and full-time associate medical director. And I only suggest that that's relevant because that may create a position or the capacity that, that currently Dr Winter doesn't have uh, in order to potentially provide that level of uh, professional oversight and support the work of the professional and uh, the care governance professional forum. Uh, I shall perhaps pause there and, and take any questions, but I hope that that update will provide, uh, will be useful to members in view of the significant issues that the audit report uh, gives rise to. Finally though, because uh, Mr. Gascon may wish to ask me about this, um, because the uh, last audit and performance committee was cancelled at, at his advice. I wrote to the chief executive of NHS Tayside and the two other chief officers on, on whose behalf we host inpatient services to advise them of some of the risks to highlight to them the particular challenges around providing that professional expertise to the forum and to reassure them that I was seeking to uh, take action to mitigate that risk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief Officer, and I, would, I suppose I would just follow up um, by saying that clearly previously the IGB identified a, a gap in terms of assurance um, over these areas, um, and I think it's important um, whatever form that assurance takes, whether it's through um, a Clinical Care and Professional Governance Committee of the IGB um, or uh, detailed reporting to the IGB, um, that we are assured that uh, the, the appropriate um, arrangements are in place. And I think also just to point out that we agreed that if the um, Clinical Care and Professional Governance Committee um, was not up and running by the time of the next Audit and Performance Committee, um, that we would seek to have a report to this committee um, instead to ensure that um, some, at some place in the IGB we were getting assurance and therefore can feed that back um, to the Integration Joint Board itself. Um, any questions on that? Mr Benson. Um, I would support that, Chair. Um, I think we need to get this sorted out as quickly as we can, really, in terms of what the assurance arrangements are for the IJB, and I just wish to reinforce the point that you're actually making. Um, it's, it's how the decision-making will be taken to enable us to get there is going to be the, the, the key issue for me, and I'd welcome any insight into from the Chief Officer in terms of what is the process that will happen before that IJB meeting um, happens. Chief Officer. So the proposals that we're bringing forward are not to um, fundamentally review uh, the provisions of either the integration scheme or to um, in any way detract from the decision that the IGB took that there was a need for a care governance committee. It is uh, a proposal that looks at how we better support um, the professional forum and how the committee can be supported because one of the challenges that we would experience is if um, Hamish Dougal as the clinical director is, is supporting the, the professional forum um, and that is also being supported by Jackie Pepper as the chief social work uh, officer. 
they would presumably not be the best people to support the committee lest they be seen to be marking their own homework. So we need to think about the ways in which we can provide uh, support to the forum, that professional support, that, that scrutiny, um, and, and that assurance that then gets reported to uh, the committee. But we also have to recognise that as well as uh, Sandra Gourley, who we have as a professional nurse, we have the services of Sarah Dickey as an associate nurse director and as a member of the IGB. So Sarah Dickey or, or, or Dougie Loudon could perhaps have a, a more active role in providing support and advice to the chair of, of the committee. So we will, on that basis, be progressing uh, arrangements um, to set up the committee. Uh, we would wish to do so on the, the basis that the report that we've got is, is really how we support and service those existing arrangements, not whether those arrangements need to be reviewed or, or revised. Um, and I very much see it as being uh, a paper that will support operational managers in the context of supporting those, those, those uh, existing frameworks. Um, so we'd be able to move with a pace without necessarily awaiting uh, approval unless members disagreed of the IGB on the 29th of April or of this committee on the 22nd of June when the next vote. I think we'd like to progress it as soon as possible and there's already been a decision of the, the IGB so I don't think there would need to be a further one but Mr Benson you wanted to come in. Oh, uh, 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 thank you Chair and, and that's very help, helpful Gordon uh, and the other part for me is the given the there's a consistency of comment at IGB particularly from users and carers in third sector about their involvement in all of our processes. Um, I, I wonder if you could give me some indication as to what extent they may be involved as part of that. It feels quite important to me, given that they will have to be advocates of it at the end of the day, whatever the arrangements are. I think it's quite critical that we've got ambassadors at local level who are able to give further reassurance beyond a professional perspective. The terms of reference of the, the new Clinical Care and Professional Governance Committee are essentially modelled on the terms of reference of the Audit and Performance Committee in, in terms of the, the governance arrangements. Obviously, there are specific differences in terms of what will be coming to that committee, but there is provision for um, carers' representatives, um, third sector representatives drawn from the IGB. Um, so it's two uh, representatives from the NHS Day side, two from the council, um, and then two from um, outside uh, those voting members. So there will be two non-voting members there. Uh, I do appreciate that, it's just in case if there are new arrangements that come into place that are different from that committee, then I want to ensure that that consistency is there, that's all. Chief Officer. So I think, I think it's important to recognise that the Clinical and Care Governance Professional Forum is, is really about officers and professional leads uh, looking at being uh, given assurance and, and applying scrutiny to, to the work across a number of services. Uh, and similarly, it would be for that group to then provide assurance to the Care Governan Governance Committee. Um, the Care Governance Committee will have representatives in terms of public partners. Uh, but I think probably the bit that's, that, that's missing from that narrative is to just recognise that the Clinical and Care Governance Professional Committee in applying assurance need to be assured about the level of stakeholder involvement in all the services that they are considering. And that should be a thread that weaves throughout the reports, increasingly perhaps in light of the, the publication of David Strang's report. Um, so I think we need to be, sure, be sure, uh, assured that there are metrics in there about the extent to which we're getting customer feedback, that, uh, uh, the extent to which we're co-producing, the extent to which we're um, uh, building improvements based on the experience of people who are using services, as well as some of the more technical, professional and clinical metrics that we might apply. So we need to look at how we can weave that throughout all the activity of the forum and, and therefore then the committee. Thank you. Um, can I ask, are there any further questions on the um, internal audit plan progress report or the U risk maturity assessment or the clinical care um, governance follow-up? Councillor Duff. Thank you, Chair. Um, just on page 26, um, under the risk management arrangements, one of the key issues that was identified was that uh, officers who are mainly charged with risk management experience are due to retire and um, that we should progress uh, re the replacement and consider nominating an individual to champion risk management at IGB board level. I just wondered if that had been ongoing, progressing. Um, Chief Officer. 
So I'm going to say a word. I'm happy for Jane to come in. Um, yes, uh, we've got a couple of people who are working with us at the moment um, very helpfully with, with a degree of expertise and, and capacity. Uh, one in it who's been working in around the strategic commissioning plan, around the workforce plan and around clinical and care governance and a, another who has been working across some of that and has been supporting us in terms of our response uh, to the joint inspection uh, as well as uh, aspects to do with our approach to strategic risk and to risk management. Um, we will find ourselves with a gap and, and we need to think about how we can fill that gap. Certainly, um, that's something that I would be keen to do. It probably needs to be accelerated and uh, cannot wait for the wider restructure of the partnership, which may take several months as we move through from the senior tier into organisational change policies and procedures. And indeed, only this weekend, the Chief Finance Officer drew my attention to the need for some uh, review and revision of the capacity that we have around corporate support and we'll be discussing that uh, moving forward, particularly in the context of, of these, these retirees. Yeah, just to, to build on what Gordon's um, said, we actually have taken steps to mitigate um, the, the um, fact that two of our experienced risk managers are leaving. We've brought um, on board um, a fixed term resource to, to learn and to um, to um, absorb some expertise to mitigate that. So Phil Gerrard, who's with us today, has been um, providing that role. So it, it, at a certain level, we've been um, doing what we can to make sure there's a transfer of expertise. Uh, what Gordon refers to is, a, is a, um, a, a more senior level of expertise that, that we require. And one of the decisions that we'll need to make as part of discussing um, how we address that is around corporate support arrangements, is around the fact that um, both partner bodies have a responsibility um, to provide us with a level of expertise. And it's whether we look to seek that from the partner bodies or whether we look to um, um, invest ourselves in additional support. Um, and you know, obviously we have very limited opportunity to invest. We have no um, resources from which to do it. So we've, got a, we've probably got quite a challenging discussion ahead with both partner bodies around how we ensure the requisite senior level of risk management expertise is supporting um, the integration joint board. Thank you. Thank you. No further questions on that? Okay, are we happy to um, agree the recommendations in that report? Agreed? Okay, thank you. Um, if we move on now to item 4.2, which is the risk management progress update, and I shall ask the Chief Officer to speak to this report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this report provides an update since we last discussed uh, the issues around our strategic risk profile uh, in September 2019. We have undertaken significant work since that point in time uh, and as was just mentioned, with the support of colleagues who have a degree of expertise around this and some additional capacity, we've had uh, regular reports to our extended management team and most recently had a half-day risk workshop when we began to fundamentally review whether or not our risks are as they should be, both in terms of whether they're articulating and describing appropriately the, the risks that we believe are uh, of strategic importance to the partnership, uh, and therefore then what are the mitigating actions, the controls, uh, and the risk rating that would apply there. Um, colleagues and members will see at page 60, there has been some progress in relation to our strategic risks with some movement in relation to uh, the five that are cited there, one around financial sustainability. One of the challenges around this risk is, um, I suppose, not dissimilar to some of the considerations that we were giving last week at the IJB to the Joint Inspection Action Plan where we had um, identified the risks as amber, even although a number of the component parts were completed or, or had been undertaken. So this risk around financial sustainability, we have in place very robust processes that seek to mitigate the risk through the, the BRG process, through the regular reports that are given to IGB and to Audit and Performance Committee, 
through the work of our finance review group, which is a regular meeting of the extended management, the executive management team, and through the financial recovery plan. So while we're taking significant action to mitigate the risk, um, that's how we manage with insufficient resource. So it doesn't address the overarching risk around financial sustainability. It's a, a series of mitigating actions that seek to ensure that we are moving as close to financial balance as we can and that we're risk assessing any of the actions that are taken within our financial recovery plan. So whilst we see some progress, um, there is that overarching risk. You know, last year we started our financial year with a structural deficit of £4.1 million. We are still unclear about whether or not a similar position will be arrived at as we move into uh, this new financial year, although we are obviously actively in discussion with the statutory partners, chief finance officers. So that's to illustrate, I suppose, some of the challenges around us. In terms of the second risk, recruitment and retention, again, we have developed a workforce plan. Uh, we need to take that further and look at what are the actions that fall from that and to deliver on them. Um, some of that is going to be about how do we mitigate what is a national challenge around the recruitment and retention of doctors, nurses, social care workers, and how do we develop new roles as well as measures that enable us to um, be a more attractive employer and to bring people into the area. I, I, won't, I didn't propose to go through all, the, all five of these and certainly um, I'm keen to take any questions. As, as will Jane, as, as the Chief Finance Officer and the author of this report, uh, and together we can look at any questions that members may have in relation to our detailed uh, strategic, full strategic risk register as necessary. Thank you, Chief Officer, for that introduction. Um, are there any questions on either the covering paper or the um, strategic risk register itself? Mr. Benson. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I find the presentation information really helpful, actually, in terms of um, seeing what the issues are and what's actually being done about it. One of the big ones that's, um, that arises at um, IGB board level on a consistent basis around the issue of communication and engagement overall. And I wondered um, what thoughts we may need to do to elevate this beyond simply risk management to opportunity management um, around um, the communication engagement. Um, and certainly um, I'm thinking about um, other places that use particular communication engagement steering groups that are not at governance level but clearly are able to direct that and it involves a whole number of different people within them. And I wonder if perhaps that's something that uh, we may have a further discussion or perhaps out with this meeting. It does strike me it's such a key issue and it's one that stakeholders consistently raise as an issue of concern for them, not just about internal workings around the professional communication um, with um, carer reps and user reps, etc. But I think it's also a general issue for us. I'm just thinking of the, um, the last discussion we had at the IJB, there was quite an important um, agreed statement made by us, and I haven't seen that as a board member um, in terms of what that statement was, yet we'd agreed it at the meeting itself, although it was probably in the public domain, but it didn't come to the board members. So I'm just, it's those kind of things that I like to have my information a bit more personalised because I'm making these decisions. So th that's just one vignette really about the where things just kind of dip. It, it, we're not unique in that way, but I'm just highlighting it as just some of the frustrations that emerge from it. Thank you. Um, Mr. Benson, I think you make a very good point. We did have a discussion about um, information sharing generally, but also in terms of how we engage with the public um, and perhaps um, tie into to some of the things that are going on both at council level in terms of Prati Kinos offer, but also NHS Tayside level in terms of transforming Tayside. Um, so I think it is very important that it isn't just seen as a risk, um, but as you say, an opportunity. But I'll pass over to the, the Chief Officer. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Benson. That, those comments are, are, are really helpful, and we will reflect on, on how we can um, seek to ensure that, that we get better in and around that space. And uh, it, is a, it is an issue that we have had some thought about, some discussion in relation to. Um, for me, there, there, there's a couple of things there, and I have to say again, they probably come back to the level of corporate support that we enjoy and the capacity that we have um, to 
better deliver on our approaches to communication and engagement. And I'll, I'll perhaps give a couple of examples um, to try to illustrate that point. Um, at the moment, we're provided with communication support by both Perth and Kinross Council and by NHS Tayside. Uh, but I think by their own admission and certainly through some discussions that I had particularly with Perth and Kinross Council two weeks ago, um, that tends to be uh, reactive media uh, responses. Uh, I'm very keen that uh, we look to changing the focus of our communication offer and uh, activity to more proactively promote the very good work that is going acro on across Perth and Kinross um, through uh, the, the, the efforts of colleagues and teams providing support in communities to deliver uh, improved services. I really like the idea of us being um, more proactive in our approach to communication, um, to seek to get out a positive message about uh, the work that we're doing, but also the added value of the Health and Social Care Partnership to affirm a clearer identity about what we are offering uh, in the context of, of, of integration, um, to tell better stories about the ways in which we are improving outcomes uh, and to be uh, have more of a, a, a presence and a visibility in terms of um, our engagement with communities through community councils, area partnerships, uh, local groups, so that that can in turn influence and inform our work moving forward. So one of the questions for me, similar to that which uh, Jane posed us is, is that make or buy question, and do we purchase or provide? Do we uh, have our own communications offer and officer potentially as part of that corporate support infrastructure, or do we make more demands of our statutory partners in terms of their comms departments and what they can offer to us? That links us, I think, to some of the discussions that we began to touch on and need to take further, and that's around both um, agenda setting for the IGB, but then if we are setting agendas and if we're um, more effectively de delivering the right types of report and on time, uh, and I think there's something that we need to do to, 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 to enhance our performance in relation to getting, getting those reports out, there's those opportunities that each individual report provides for us to be proactively doing some press release that says next week the IGB will consider a report that talks about you know, the ways in which we are engaging to deliver our community mental health strategy, blah, 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 you know, and provide that detail. So some of that's about the, the support to the IGB and how that links to comms. Um, but I think there's also something about our infrastructure providing more support to uh, colleagues who uh, administer and support and work with committee services and IGB members. Uh, and again, perhaps at a, a, a more senior level to make those connections between the executive management team the IGB and, uh, and our communications offers, uh, offer. So within the proposals that we're looking at around restructure, um, there is a recognised need to think about how we might address that. Um, and that may well be about a post or it may well be about people carrying portfolios, but in the context of um, having uh, an enhanced capacity within the executive and senior management team within the partnership. Thank you. Follow up, Mr. Benson. If I may just follow up on that. Um, I think it's, it's really important that um, we see this as a priority and something we need to do sooner rather than later. There are rather a lot of long-term things that will take some time to unfold, and I appreciate that. Um, I have some ex expertise in this because I used to chair a communi communication and engagement at a national level for a national um, public organisation. And I, I understand that it's not just about communicating messages, it's about influencing those messages as well. And it's interesting that at uh, a conference late last year um, on health and social care partnerships, um, I think it was organised by COSLAC, or it's the new body that organises these things, the Cabinet Secretary, one of the key speakers, said that she had lots of communication with um, chief executives of health boards, she had lots of communication with chief executives of local authorities, but as a rule, she didn't have much communication directly from integration joint boards. So for me, there's an issue about this that I think we need to be addressing more fully in terms of the instance we have, not just with at that 
at that bigger level, but also across the piece with other integration with joint boards as well. I think particularly within um, um, the Tayside area, I think it's quite critical we have a bit more engagement with our colleagues elsewhere who are dealing with many similar issues. So I just offer that. Thank you. Um, Councillor Duff. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just a general comment. And first, it's, it's comforting to note that obviously there's been no detrimental movement in terms of any of the strategic risks and indeed improvement in, in, uh, in, in four of them. Um, in relation to the recruitment and retention uh, risk, um, and obviously coming from a, a, a rural constituency within Perth and Kinross Council, um, I'm always conscious that re recruitment and retention of medical nursing staff within rural areas is a, a particular issue, and we had the recent restrictions at uh, the minor engine illness unit at Portlochry, for instance. So I'm just conscious of, of question I suppose is within that recruitment retention policy in the workforce plan is that aspect of rural rurality being considered? Chief Officer. Yes, um, certainly uh, we are acutely aware that across Perth and Kinross, which I think is the five most rural mainland authority in Scotland, of the challenges around people being access deprived and, and of the challenges of providing services in, in rural and remote communities. Um, in relation to uh, this particular issue and the challenges around uh, Highland Perthshire, uh, we have been um, benefiting from discussions between NHS Tayside and Perth and Kinross Council about whether uh, a more effective partnership approach could be taken to look at how we might su uh, support the inward recruitment of, of workers, um, particularly, I suppose, from, from, the, from the health side. So the Chief Executive for the Council, for example, has, has been keen to, to offer key worker status to incoming health workers, and with that, the potential that they would be able to access some Council housing offers were, were that available to them. So I suppose that's one small example. The other ways in which we are looking to address this is to think about how we can work in a more integrated way between health and social care. Um, there, the other options are around us thinking about um, if we can't sustain services on a nurse-led basis because we can't at attract nurses into the area, is there something different we, we can be doing with healthcare support workers or social care workers to, to bridge some of that, that gap? And we do need to think about a more integrated as, a, approach. The other options for us are around the challenges that we're experiencing in relation to social care provision and the provision of care at home services in, in rural and remote parts of um, Perth and Kinross. And that's led us to fundamentally review whether or not we can continue to sustain the current arrangements of only outsourcing care at home or whether we need to be thinking about a, a in-house service um, being developed that would perhaps um, challenge us financially for it would likely be more expensive but at least afford us that continuity, consistency and quality that's sometimes lacking when we rely on private providers um, who themselves have, have recruitment challenges. Now each of those are, are perhaps only going some way to address the challenge. We need to probably think more creatively uh, and we are beginning to explore whether there's a different way in which we might provide care and support in some parts of uh, Highland Perthshire by looking at how we can build on a very strong and cohesive community capacity and a community spirit to think about how we can use the cooperative uh, uh, aspects of, of activity there to think about existing community groups and whether we can overlay that with um, some provision that might actually allow and um, empower those communities to take greater control of the arrangements and delivery of care services. Um, so we want to um, not work against and, and not even work alongside, but we want to empower that sort of community capacity. And uh, the head of uh, social work, social care, Diane Fraser, is, is beginning to scope out what that might look like by doing some benchmarking with, with similar arrangements that, that have worked elsewhere. But uh, I probably don't want to be challenged too much in the detail of that, and I don't want to overpromise because th those are early discussions 
uh, an exploration that we're, we're, we're now advancing. Uh, thank you, Chair. That's very helpful, and I appreciate the fact that you can't come in with detail, but I'm, I'm encouraged that uh, it's not being lost in all of the, the uh, issues. Thank you. Any further questions on this report? Okay, can we um, agree the recommendations um, in the report? Agreed, thank you. If we now move on to item 4.3, which is the update on the audit recommendations, and I shall ask the Chief Financial Officer to speak to this report. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to focus um, my um, overview on the outstanding audit recommendations, of which there are currently six. Um, of those six, um, one relates to the production of the Strategic Commissioning Plan, which has now been agreed, um, and therefore, at the next update of this recommendation, that will be um, shown as complete. There is a further recommendation around the creation of the Partnership Improvement Plan, and um, there was significant discussion and a presentation on that at last week's IGB meeting, and we were able to reassure the IGB that we now have a Partnership Improvement Plan, which will be coming forward um, to the Audit Reforms Committee um, for um, overview and for assurance to be provided on progress. So whilst there are six outstanding um, overdue recommendations, two of those are effectively now complete. Um, the four remaining, I would just um, go through um, briefly. Um, recommendation number 24, um, at the heart of that um, is around how we link our financial planning with our strategic planning. We have had some success with that, with our older people in unscheduled care, um, invest to save um, proposals, which again were um, brought to the IGB last week when we heard about um, the investment in the enhanced community support in the link service. So that was um, the linking of financial planning and strategic planning at its very best. And that's what we need to ensure. Um, and as the terms of reference come forward um, to the next IGB around our new strategic planning arrangements, making sure those the close links between strategic and financial planning, I think certainly is a priority for me, and I know it's a priority for Gordon too. So hopefully that will come through. You'll see, get some assurance around addressing that recommendation in the terms of reference as they come forward. And the next over overdue recommendation um, is 33, and as I've mentioned, that relates to the creation of a partnership improvement plan, which is now, in fact, complete. The next outstanding recommendation relates to um, inpatient um, mental health services um, and st the strategic risk um, around them. Um, so certainly in terms of the IGB receiving reports on mental health services redesign, that's a commitment that's now been um, made and regular reports are now coming forward as, 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 as it's possible to do so. So that aspect is now um, complete. In relation to the strategic risk um, for mental health, that has been part of the, um, the, the workshop that we've had in February, but I think if, if we are um, being um, open and transparent, there is absolutely further work to do um, on that risk that takes on board the wider dynamic now of the independent inquiry report, the recommendations and what that means for Perth and North Integration Joint Board and how we mitigate the risk to this IGB um, as opposed to wider risks around mental health services for all of, all of Tayside. Um, the next um, outstanding recommendation relates to a schedule of reporting um, on those services that are hosted by Dundee and Angus, and that's a discussion that is still ongoing with the Chair, um, and we will need to consider that in relation to the next, uh, the April um, IGB meeting. The fifth outstanding recommendation relates, relates to the Strategic Commission Plan, which is now complete, and the sixth, I, I think this, I'm not actually sure which the sixth, I think we've only got five outstanding recommendations from my calculation, I mean just to check the numbers there, I'm happy to take um, questions, Gordon, I don't know if you want to supplement in, in terms of any of these.
No, I, th I mean, I think you've covered it all, Jane. The, there is a bit of duplication, I think, in relation to the strategic planning ones. Um, so the delivery of the strategic plan is one and, and the alignment of our strategies with financial planning uh, being the other. I think you've covered them. Okay, thank you. Um, do members have any questions on anything covered um, in this report or um, specifically covered by the Chief Financial Officer? Yeah, I just wanted to make um, one more, uh, two more points actually. Um, the clinical care and professional governance recommendations that had previously been made in an audit report had been removed on the basis that they would be reported to the clinical care governance committee who subsequently had advice from the chief internal auditor and they should still be in here and the audit forms committee should oversee progress across all recommendations whether they relate to clinical care governance um, or not so they th those that we've seen today in the report will be brought back under the umbrella of this report the other th the other recommendation that that we want to um, adopt is ensuring that all recommendations and actions arising are included in the partnership improvement plan and actually very many of them are but we want to make an expl explicit link to give assurance that um, all of the actions that are come out from recommendations are then covered as part of the partnership improvement plan so making that link uh, we will do that for the for the next meeting thank you no questions Okay, are we um, happy to agree the recommendation in this report then? Agreed, thank you. Okay, if we move on now to item 4.4, which is the Perth and Kinross Integration Joint Board Audit Strategy, um, and I think I'll ask Mr. Wilkie from KPNG to speak to this report. Thank you. Um, I will uh, just speak to two pages which summarise our report and then take questions. I should just say, first of all, it says draft on the front, but should be taken as final as it's been agreed with management. Um, so starting on page 94, it really summarises the purpose of this report, which is to set out our overall audit strategy for the year ahead, for the well, 1920 year almost finished, actually. Um, the background is that this is year four of a five-year appointment. As auditors of the IJB, we're appointed by Audit Scotland and it will be my second year as engagement leader. The overall objectives are to conduct the audit work that we consider necessary in order to ultimately be able to issue an opinion on the financial statements, and that's both on the numbers included and also on broader aspects of wi uh, wider scope areas such as financial sustainability and management, governance and transparency, and value for money. No changes to the overall scope of the audit. Um, on page 94, the headlines uh, include the detail of our approach. Our materiality is set on the same basis as the prior year at 1% of gross expenditure. So that's £2 million. Ultimately, we seek to identify er er errors that may arise at a lower threshold below that amount and we'll report any errors that we identify exceeding £100,000 either individually or in aggregate to the committee and also any errors which we might consider are material by their nature rather than by the financial amount attached with them. On the left-hand side of page 94, we set out details of the audit risks. There are two presumed significant risks in any audit. Um, we accept one of those exists here and we rebut the existence of the other. So we accept the presumed risk that management is in a unique position and therefore able to override controls. And we uh, conduct our testing in order to identify any instances where that may have occurred. The second presumed risk is uh, management's ability to manipulate income recognition. We rebut that risk because of the nature of the IJB and the way in which it receives and effectively records expenditure. Two bullet points set out the specific um, focus areas which we consider exist within the audit and that's the completeness and accuracy of expenditure based on the way in which the board obtains information on expenditure from partner bodies and secondly financial sustainability linking through to those wider scope areas on financial management and financial sustainability we do accept that that's a focus area both in terms of ongoing funding arrangements risk sharing with the partner bodies and moving to the three-year financial plan and it will be an area that we report on in our annual audit report 
The other aspects beyond um, wider scope within this report are just to note that we confirm our independence, set out our proposed audit fee and our quality arrangements within KPMG. And, and since there's a paper later, I'll just mention our fee composition at the moment, which is on page 95. We set out the total fee proposed for the IJB. Not all of that ultimately is received by KPMG. Um, our fee is set in, in within a range, which is indicated by Audit Scotland. We are able to negotiate a fee um, plus or minus 10% from the midpoint proposed by Audit Scotland without further approval with them. And we've proposed a fee at the top of the range that's consistent with the prior year and reflect really um, our consideration of the risks and work which is required in the IGB. And in fact, all IGBs um, from a KPMG's perspective rather than just specific to Perth and Kinross. And that was really all I wanted to say. There is more detail in the report on our approach to each risk, um, but I'll maybe just take questions. Thank you, Mr. Wilkie. Um, do you members have any questions on the audit strategy? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Moving on, and as uh, Mr. Wilkie mentioned in his presentation, to uh, item 4.5, which is the Audit Scotland statutory fees, um, and I'll ask the Chief Financial Officer to speak to this report. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is the first time that we've brought the proposed audit fee to the Audit Performance Committee for approval. Um, we're doing that in line with um, best practice um, around um, audit committees, so um, that's the reason why um, when we show a comparison to last year, um, you know, we, we have to note that the fee didn't come forward for, for scrutiny last year, but we're doing so now. Um, so as um, Michael has said, um, audit um, Scotland have proposed a fee um, of 26,560. However, KPMG um, have um, proposed a higher fee. That is the maximum 10% um, higher fee of 29,210 for the reasons that Michael has outlined. Um, and in line with the fact that this is in, in, in um, keeping with the range, um, that Audit Scotland have agreed don't require to go back to Audit Scotland, then I, I am recommending that the Audit Forms Committee uh, um, accept the proposed fee. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions on this report? No. Are we happy to agree the uh, recommendation? Agree? Thank you. Right, if we move on now to the performance section of the agenda, um, and uh, we have the Perth and Kinross Health and Social Care Partnership quarterly performance report. Um, I just want to say first, I think it's really good that um, this is um, on the agenda today. Um, I know that we have had uh, reports from the um, former now, older people in unscheduled care, uh, programme of care board. Um, and obviously at the IGB last week, we agreed new um, strategic planning arrangements, but this report brings together um, the uh, performance reporting for the whole of the partnership, which will hopefully allow us to um, do better our uh, performance role um, as part of the Audit and Performance um, Committee. So I shall ask the Chief Officer to speak to this report. Thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> Just to add to your, your introduction, uh, we have um, previously been in a position where we've reported annually. The statutory annual performance report has been available and approved by this committee and uh, the IGB. We have the ambition to report on a quarterly basis in relation to the high level strategic indicators uh, that fall within that statutory reporting framework. However, we have developed our approach to performance reporting and are intending to continue to do so to get to a position where, as well as reporting on a quarterly basis to this committee in relation to performance against those high-level indicators, we can enhance that by developing a range of performance measures that sit below those uh, and give uh, some assurance and update to this committee and the IGB in relation to the progress against the strategic priorities within our commissioning plan. 
So, as members will recall uh, from last week's IJB, the intention to de deliver strategic planning groups in relation to uh, various care groups um, will ensure that we, within those groups, have identified the key priorities that they will be delivering on, the key performance information that they will produce, and the alignment that that has uh, to the delivery of our strategic commissioning plan. So as well as this high-level report, we will be looking for strategy groups um, through time to develop their own performance measures. We also, uh, and there's an item later on today's agenda around locality reporting, we would be wishing to look at how we can um, disaggregate the information in this high-level quarterly report into localities to see if there are any particular um, deficits, trends, issues that we need to consider. Um, but equally, we would want those locality teams to be developing their own uh, performance measures, again, in, in pursuance of our strategic priorities and the delivery of our strategic commissioning plan. Um, so this is very much uh, the appendix to this report, um, the first cut in relation to what we would intend to be reporting. It is three quarters of the way into the year, so the next report will uh, inevitably be our annual performance report. But behind the scenes, we're working on a framework that will look at what do we need in terms of um, management information? How can we, within our executive management team, review performance and progress? Um, how does that then feed into more formal reports at a more statutory level to, to committees and, and boards of the IJB? Uh, and essentially, we're, we're being asking you to consider this first iteration, which seeks to balance um, data with some more qualitative information about some of the work that's going on within the partnership and whether we've got that balance right, I, I, I would welcome your views. Um, in order to better be able to tell a story about the difference that we're making and the ways in which we're seeking to achieve improvements and outcomes. So the reports um, for your consideration at uh, Appendix 1, and I uh, just probably need to acknowledge the work that's gone into this, particularly from, from Chris Jolly, who's uh, with us today and would, would probably be to whom I would be deferring the much more difficult questions that you're about to ask me. Um, but equally, Chris can also give uh, a bit of description around um, the wider performance framework that, that this is one output from and which we will be developing and reporting back to this committee on in due course. But this is the, 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 the first cut of that. Thank you, Chief Officer. Um, and just to reiterate the point that um, as with uh, previous reports of this nature, I think we welcome feedback from members of this committee in terms of the format of it. Um, and uh, I appreciate that you haven't had the full week to look at this, so I presume you'd also welcome any feedback after the fact if, if people don't um, feel they've had the, um, the requisite time to, to inform an opinion on, on the format. Okay. Any questions on this report? Councillor Dunn. <coughs> Not so much a question. I think it's, it's just, um, as you say, there not an awful lot of time to go through it, and I would welcome the opportunity to provide feed feedback in coming days with regard to it. But I would have to say that uh, I felt that the kind of style of it and the format of it was, was, was actually quite welcome in terms of uh, the information it contains and, and uh, uh, how, it, how it looks and feels, I suppose, is, 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 uh, is um, I, I, I quite I like the, the kind of style. But so in terms of maybe um, specific comments with regards to its contents or questions, um, I would welcome the opportunity maybe to come back to you in relation to that. Mr. Benson. Oh, thank you very much. Um, it's um, it's quite comprehensive, actually. So it's it's very difficult to um, kind of um, and it's, that's my difficulty, not yours. Um, it what would be quite useful in this because it's um, it's such a, a key um, document. It might be worthy of a presentation, actually, and I think that would help to draw out what are the things we should be focusing on because there's rather a lot of information here. I know I'm not a regular member of the group, but I, I, I remember looking and I thought there's some really good sections here, but it's, there's quite a lot strong wordy narrative, and sometimes 
I just kind of need an image or I need something that will make it a bit snappier for me to focus my attention on things. Otherwise, I, I see everything but not perhaps grasp what's really important at times. Um, it's just, just a reflection on, on skimming through it. I'm interested to see what, hear what um, Beatrice has views on it. But it's, um, it, all the headings are absolutely right for me. They're addressing the important things that we want to look at. Um, but just really a presentational issue, I would say that uh, I would hope that you might get a more engaging discussion, is what I think I'm suggesting. Thank you, Mr. Benson. Can I just ask on the, um, the national performance indicators on page 27, and it says that it's, um, these are conducted every two years. I suppose a lot of the statements there are quite... Um, qualitative rather than uh, it's quantitative information that we're getting from it. I'm just wondering how, uh, how that information is collected, what, what the sample size is, how that is um, showing us the on the indicators. So th th you, you've illustrated my earlier point that this is one of the questions that I'm going to ask Australia to answer. Um, however, I think it's important to, to highlight, um, so the fact that this is a, a health and care experience survey that's carried out two years means there, there is probably limited value in us producing a, a, these set of indicators for every quarterly report of, of, of this committee. But for my, I suppose, um, from my perspective, I think it's probably important that we reflect on if, if this is worth doing and if this is meaningful data or uh, outcome information, the question I would be putting back to the strategy groups and the locality teams is how can we construct something that more regularly gets that sort of feedback in relation to people's experiences so that we're not waiting for that two-year period. Um, and you'll see the comments down the bottom that, that we, we, we're looking at how we can do that. Um, but maybe if Chris has any background information about case as it's described um, and the sample, you could give us some information. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Gordon. Um, yeah, I can't give you specifics about the sample size, but what I can tell you um, is that the Health and Care Experience Survey is done at a national level um, every two years and is fairly um, extensive. Um, we're, we've actually just gone through the process um, of carrying out the survey in the last few months and we would be expecting um, the new survey results uh, to be coming out later this year. Um, just picking up on one of the things that, that um, Gordon suggested, I'm a, I am aware that at a more gra granular level um, within the HSCP we're carrying out our own um, surveys and the point that you've made, uh, Chair, about the sample size and, and just how ro robust um, we are in our approach to creating a much higher level output to demonstrate that things have moved in one direction or the other is really the work that's going on at the minute to try and satisfy ourselves s so that we don't come to the committee in reference to the indicators with a relatively small sample size. It, 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 they may be highly relevant in s relation to a particular service or area, um, but we need to be clear that when we're reporting at the strategic level that we're giving a proper flavour for what's actually happening. And just to follow up on that, on the, the national performance indicators um, over the page on page 28 and then the MSG indicators on page 29, those are showing, um, you know, the year up to October in comparison with the previous year. Is the intention that each quarter to, to move to the appropriate period and then compare that with um, the previous year or will we be looking at, you know, one quarter versus the previous quarter? How, how do you propose doing that? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, uh, uh, the, the difference between, as you've articulated, uh, between the, the HACE uh, indicators and the ones uh, on page 28 and 29 is that the, um, those from uh, National Indicator 11 and on are updated much more regularly. Um, indeed, uh, some, quite a number of them on a monthly basis. So <coughs> we'd welcome feedback from the committee as to how best the committee would want that to be reported. What we've done here is the year up to versus the year previously up to. So you're getting a full... 12-month um, comparison. Um, we've, we've taken advice from our colleagues in uh, LIST, uh, the Local Intelligence Service, uh, and that was their proposal as to how best to articulate it, but I'd welcome the feedback um, if the committee would prefer it to be done in a different way. Well, I suppose the question would be to what extent would 
just looking at one quarter be meaningful because it might be too small a sample size as we were discussing earlier on. Um, I think if there are no further questions um, at this moment in time, just to reiterate that obviously once people have had the chance to um, digest this a bit further, that it would be useful to have um, more feedback uh, for officers on the way uh, in which these in this information is reported going forward. But I think also just because of the importance of, of this report to the whole of the IGB, um, it might be worthwhile, at least just for information, um, circulating it to um, all members of the Integration Joint Board, not just the members on this committee. Uh, and they might also have um, some feedback um, on that. I appreciate some people are, are substituting it for this meeting. So it is useful that everyone is aware um, of the way in which we're reporting this information, even if they don't sit specifically on this committee. Okay, well, thank you very much, though, for the, um, the, the work on that and bringing this um, to the meeting today. Thank you. Okay, moving on now to item 5.2, which is the 2019-20 uh, financial position, um, and I shall ask the Chief Financial Officer to introduce her report. Thank you, Chair. The forecast um, for the year-end for Perth and Cross IJB is a forecast um, overspend of £3.3 .3 million. Pounds. Um, this is an improvement of half a million pounds since the last um, report um, to the committee. Um, it reflects the implementation of um, agreed financial recovery actions, um, but also reflects um, most particularly a significant improvement in the um, GP prescribing position, um, which is um, an improvement that's been a benefit not only um, to us, but to the IJBs in Tayside and indeed across Scotland. We continue to identify all other opportunities to appropriately reduce expenditure and we'll report back um, on our success in doing so at the, at the next meeting. The, um, in relation to um, our financial planning and budget setting, at section six in the report, um, we set out our intention to bring the budget for the IGB to um, our next meeting in April. I'm pleased to say that we've now agreed that actually we will be um, setting up an additional meeting of the IGB to bring forward a three-year financial recovery plan and associated budget to that additional meeting to ensure that in line with best practice, we are able to set a budget in advance um, of the financial year. Our work with both um, partner bodies continues um, in relation to um, the budget um, offer um, that will be made and um, I look forward to um, reporting back on the, um, what that means for our three-year financial plan um, at the next meeting. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Chief Financial Officer. Are there any questions on this report? Councillor Duff. Um, on page 122 at item 4, areas of further financial risk, um, it talks about there about um, an inpatient mental health medical locum costs of £300,000. Is that, that, can you explain a wee bit more further about what that involves? So what, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. What we've seen um, over the last few years and continue to see is that um, um, whether it be retirals, um, resignations, um, or substantive staff, um, losing substantive staff from the inpatient mental health um, consultant um, group, um, that our forecast position has changed um, materially um, over the course of the year. And what we're saying there is that should, something, should anything happen, um, although we're now approaching the end of the financial year, so we, we wouldn't get that same impact, the, f the, f the premium cost of losing a substantive um, consultant psychiatrist and replacing that with a locum consultant psychiatrist um, comes at a premium of £300,000. Okay, then, all the more reason to <laughs> push ahead with that. Okay, um, is it, uh, I did have another question. I can find that. Um, yeah, it's probably... Um, my lack of understanding of it. In, in page 121 at 3.3, .3, um, it talks about 
a forecast overspend of 0 0.1, uh, 100,000 pounds with regard to the net overspend on 2C GP practice across Dundee and Angus. Um, and that'll be in our share. I wonder, can you just give me a bit more information about that situation? Yes, we, um, as, a, as a partnership, we have been in some significant discussion around the equity of being um, past a share of 2C practice costs that um, um, are incurred by other IGBs. Um, pr 2C practice costs are incurred when a GP practice, um, when the partners hand back the, their contract to the health board. The health board then have a responsibility to provide general medical services. And when that happens, it, it comes at significantly increased cost to the board. Um, if we look um, at what, as what has happened recently in, in, in Bridge of Erne, that did not go down the 2C route, that went to a dispersal route and that kept additional costs to a minimum. However, in Angus and Dundee, um, over a number of years, they've gone for um, a, a, a 2C arrangement at significant increased costs, um, which based on historical agreement before the creation of the IGBs, those costs were spread and they continue to be spread. We believe that's inequitable. However, we've been unable to secure um, alternative agreement. Um, NHST side have told us that until all three IGBs agree to a different share basis, we have to continue to bear the costs. is a, a point that has been raised on a number of occasions, Councillor Duff, and is, is one of my uh, bugbears um, as well, particularly given the, the Bridge of Iron um, situation and inequity there. Any further um, questions on this report? Mr Benson. It's not, a, it's not a question as such, it's more of a comment really. Um, we spend quite a lot of time trying to justify to the public where we spend and how we spend money, um, whatever, wherever the source of it comes from. And I think um, when people really see the real cost of care and looking at some of the, the ones that were in the area for further financial risk, when you look at one single care package, I think it can cost £300,000 a year. Now, how many more of those kind of cases would have significant impact on any delivery body? And I think it's the scale of that. And I wonder if we really need to, uh, again, it's coming back to this bit about instead of just looking at an overall deficit position, perhaps it's the human story a bit about what the real cost of care is, because there, there is a, there's an important, I think another opportunity, I would say, um, to say to people, actually, people may have views on the cost of, um, of care, but actually, it really does cost a lot of money, particularly when you're looking at people with multiple impairments and how you're supporting them in the community with a range of different um, things. And I would, say that is a is a, a, a communication opportunity for you to think about this because these are not going to go away this is the real world that we're actually dealing with here i just want to make that point because often it just feels about it's an internal process but actually it's much more fundamental than that um, so i just make that comment the chief officer is going to answer your non-question with a comment um, <coughs> I think that's another point well made that we need to reflect on. I think we have uh, taken up the time of this and, and other committees um, with uh, various reports on, on the £4 million that we don't have rather than the £200 million that we do have. And I think we need to probably be, be more open and transparent and, and uh, you know, actively promote how that public pound is improving outcomes for people and provide some narrative around that. Perhaps in the context um, of your particular comment around people with learning disabilities and complex care needs, um, we can perhaps present some of that information through the development of the strategy that we're working up. Um, there's lots of good work going on there that's looking at accommodation, that's looking at youngsters transitioning from children into adult services. There is work that we're doing around trying to support people to move out of long-stay hospitals, out of Strathmartin, and there is other work where we are looking at how we might repatriate to, to bring back home people who are currently placed quite far from home in uh, specialist residential accommodation to enable them to be supported back in Perth and Kinross 
uh, in a way that is much more person-centered, more homely, using technology and, and building community connections. Um, so maybe there are opportunities whenever we're developing a strategy or bringing forward a proposal for us to be better able to uh, articulate how we are effectively and efficiently spending uh, money to change people's lives uh, rather than our preoccupation is that budget gap and how we can achieve financial recovery, which is absolutely essential uh, and is important that the, 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 the committee, the, the BRG and, and, and the IGB are, are well cited on. Um, and uh, we, we need to continue to, to raise that, but, but yes, your, your point's well made in relation to um, how much we are investing um, to, to make a difference in people's lives. Chief Financial Officer. Just to, to build on Gordon's point, I think we, we've actually discussed it earlier on in the agenda, linking um, our financial strategy to our um, strategic um, plans. And one of um, the reasons that I've been pushing um, around the terms of reference for the, the new strategic framework is because as we come forward with strategies, we've got the opportunity to do exactly what you describe, Bob, is to, to be much more positive about the total resources available how we're using it at the moment and how we plan to change that. And the right place for that is, is, is in, a, in a strategic plan where we actually take the step of talking about the resources that are available to us. And I think we've not been very good at that up until now. I think if we were to look at the str strategies that have come forward, we, there are no discussion about budget. And I think that needs to change because there can be a positive narrative about the level of spend available to us um, in those strategy documents rather than sitting somewhere elsewhere as part of a communications strategy, but embedded in str strategic plans with, with positivity around available resources. Thank you. Any further comments or questions on the financial position? Okay, um, if we move on now to item 5.3, which is an update from um, localities. And um, this is something that I've been quite keen to have on the um, agenda for some time, particularly given the performance uh, scrutiny responsibilities of the Audit and Performance Committee. Um, and um, as we've been mentioning before, we are... Uh, we are a, a service delivery organization and, and sometimes um, we do um, spend an awful lot of time um, talking about uh, finance and governance, which of course is important, but we do need to make sure that we also give the appropriate scrutiny to the way in which we deliver um, our services. Um, so I'll first pass over to the Chief Officer um, for this item. Thank you. So um, we now have a new strategic commissioning plan and uh, when reflecting on how uh, we might report on delivery within localities, we recognise that the important thing moving forward is how do the localities um, use the strategic commissioning plan to uh, be held to account for the delivery of local services uh, in pursuance of the strategic priorities. That's where we would wish to go. Um, where we've come from is a situation where we have quite detailed operational plans um, in localities and we perhaps don't have a degree of consistency across those three areas and, and those three plans. They're at different stages of their evolution um, and we recognise that this is something that we would wish to develop further. Um, but Amanda's going to perhaps provide a, a, an update of the work that's, that she's been advancing with colleagues in, in her locality. Uh, and that can perhaps inform some discussion about how we take this item forward and satisfy um, the committee's ambition for locality planning moving forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chief Officer. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to come and update you this morning on the current progress around um, our locality action plan for the North Locality. To set the scene, a bit of background for the North Perthshire locality consists of two distinct sub-locality areas, Highland, Perthshire and Strathmore, and Karsh of Gowrie for social work services. Most of the settlements are located on or close to the main transport corridors, but access to services remains a strong issue for residents in the north. North Perthshire comprises of the following major settlements of Aberfeldy, Ayloth, Blair Athol, Blair Gowrie, Cooper Angus, Dunkeld and Pitlochry, Invergowrie and Errol for the Karsh of Gowrie for social work services. With an overall population of 50,338 residents, it has the highest 
number and proportion of individuals aged over 65, and the lowest number and proportion of children. The key issues for our locality from the locality perspective, we have the highest number and proportion of those aged over 65, as I've already mentioned, um, across the three localities. North Persia has 45% of its population living in the 15 most accessed to provide beta zones in Scotland. 9.6 of families with dependent children aged under 20 receive child tax credits or income support. We have higher numbers of people with learning disabilities compared with South Persia and Perth City, and we have a transient population increase during the summer periods. The locality is split into two sub-localities, as previously mentioned, North West Persia and Strathmore. Each sub-locality has four G prax GP practices within each. In northwest, we have Aberfeldy, Rannoch, Dunkeld, Stanley, and Pitlochry, and in Strathmore, Ardblair, Strathmore, and Bargowrie, and Ayloch and Peter Angus. Over the past two years, we've built the locality infrastructure to support communication engagement of the staff and the leadership team of our team leaders and clinical managers by the North Locality Management Group, where this action plan sits as part of that development. We ensure our safety, governance, and risk is managed through our North Locality Governance Group based on the Teesside Getting It Right framework that Gordon has mentioned this morning. This has currently been refreshed as the Chief Officer has already discussed. Um, we describe our, um, our locality engagement through our community engagement workers and we produce a locality newsletter as part of that locality engagement every three months and that's shared with our partners across the locality. We have two community hospitals, two minor injury units at Pitlochry Community Hospital and Blairgowrie Community Hospital. And we're building our integrated care teams around the subcluster models with the current and new developments around our primary care strategic direction that will further enhance this approach. So our current action plan is based around the previous strategic commissioning plan and priorities, prevention early intervention, person-centered care and support, working together with communities, reducing inequalities, making the best use of available facilities, people and resources, and keeping people safe. Further developments, developments are allowing us to plan our work around urgent and unscheduled care and planned care approaches, and these are now being reflected in some of the redesign work which we'll do, talk about shortly. This is also fit in line with some of the care group strategies that have already been mentioned this morning. We're probably at a refresh point, as our Chief Officer has mentioned, um, following the update of the Strategic Commissioning Plan and the Corporate Reporting Structure and Performance Framework that's been developed. And I think that will allow us to further develop these plans robustly in terms of um, the golden thread from strategic planning governance arrangements through to our operational planning level that will allow us to um, robustly update these plans going forward. So to give you a flavour of some of the work that has been going on um, and is currently ongoing, um, under our prevention and early intervention, we're developing a lot of work around the urgent care model um, and specifically around a, a service called Locality Integrated Care Service. So this is a, a service that's under development that will support an integrated way of working across the localities um, that would develop the clinical pathways required to ensure that patients get to the right place at the right time. Um, and we've recruited different um, members of staff across the multidisciplinary team to support this model. We've also um, recently appointed our lead advanced nurse practitioner who will assist developing the advanced nurse practice model for, the, for, for Kirkland and Ross, but also around the North localities. And we're working with a um, rapid response team and, a current, and recruiting current SCOs to the dedicated North locality team to respond to the social care demands as part of that model. So that's very much work in progress um, um, and we're a bit ahead of this curve, I suppose, in terms of the North locality having um, our staff recruited and in place. Some of you may be aware about the Aberfeldy model that we've been working on for the past year or so. And this is an integrated model of care between health and social care and Scottish Ambulance Service which will provide some care and treatment services and locally based clinics for adult patients um, within the locality. Um, we're working on developing um, the Near Me technology, which is a video conferencing um, facilities which will allow patients to attend um, the local clinic um, but have their clinic appointments through the video conference facility instead of traveling long distances to Nine Wells and Perthwell Infirmary. So that's very much work in progress um, for the local area. 
um, and an exciting development, I think, in terms of our model going forward. We're also working um, with some of our tech developments, and I've already mentioned that, around the near-me technology, GP engagement um, around BP scale-up um, technology, which allows um, patients to text in their BP um, readings and to get some advice through a tech system. Um, we're also reviewing tech used across the client and services to establish um, an improved means of response within the North locality. We're looking at how we might use um, Alexa type devices linked to comm alarms and that can be responded to by the community teams. So there's much work going on around the tech and this has been led really through the tech steering group and a new tech program manager who's recently been employed. Another um, piece of development work, which is a national piece of work we're involved in, is called Living Well and Dying Well with Community. It's a national collaborative um, supported by the iHub, and we're um, developing um, a, an approach um, in the Dunkel GP practice initially um, to managing patients with severe frailty. So this will allow us to develop um, anticipated care planning, um, different types of conversations with patients earlier, allowing us to improve outcomes and to ensure that uh, patients are getting to where they need to be at the right time um, and, and, and hopeful that the plans that are in place will prevent deterioration or admission to hospital going forward. Care and treatment services, many of you will know, has been, part, has been developed as part of the GP contract, the primary care improvement plan, um, to deliver GP services um, different to the current models of care. We're currently developing a hub in Aberfeld with the Orkney and Bird Dowry, and the other practices that outlie from that will have an in-reach service in terms of delivering lobotomy, wound care, and air syringery. Social prescribing, we're developing um, a social prescribing model within our, our local community, and we're trying to embed a social prescribing model to support change um, for the way that patients might be managed in the locality and signposting people to the most appropriate service at the most appropriate point. Um, that's um, progressing really well, and we're one year into the project, and there's currently a bid for continued funding to the post with a view to, to making these permanent positions. Our mental health and wellbeing nurses are another area that's been progressed and, and has been received very well in the cluster. Um, we have four staff now appointed to the North locality um, who are at the front door of the GP practice um, where patients can be directed um, um, to, to the mental health and wellbeing nurses rather than seeing the GP. And what we're finding is this is supporting the infrastructure of the GP practices very well. Um, and we've had very positive feedback from the GP um, as part of the cluster. We've recently just um, completed um, an evaluation of that service just six months into the project. Um, so that, that's going very well. Um, and we'll continue to evaluate going forward. We have employment support teams based in Blairdowie and Aberfeldy, um, and these have been put in place to improve young for young people and adults with additional challenges and barriers to work. Um, and this is, takes an early intervention approach promoted to enhance job retention. Referral, referrals are received from locality agencies for supportive employment services from beginning of five-stage employee pipeline. In terms of personal care centre and support, um, we've continued to focus on how our integrated care teams function. So apart from developing the, the links pathway that I've already mentioned, we're having the teams focus in a much more interdisciplinary way, focus on patients who may be delayed in discharge, who may have community care concerns, or we may consider patients that are at risk from deterioration or from falls or from um, any other issues that may cause um, admission to hospital. We've implemented um, robust discharge pathways from community hospitals, again, across the multidisciplinary teams in health and care, um, and that will link soon into our new links model, um, and we'll work with the local GP practices to, to identify how this functions going forward. We've recently introduced recovery cafes in Aberfeldy, Cutlochie and Blair Dowry, and these have been introduced to support local people in terms of the recovery. These again have been very well received by the locality and by the people that they, they are there to serve. And that's an ongoing area that we will continue to evaluate. We have a palliative care hub and cafe being developed from our Darwin care home as part of a community asset approach. 
We continue to um, deliver self-directed support and to increase the choice and control for all families and people being cared for at home. And we're continuing to work with teams and, and localities to increase the knowledge and understanding of these processes. We've also developed a footstep programme, which has been delivered by our Healthy Community Collaborative Workers, which is allowing people to self-manage their own foot care, um, and this can be delivered um, in groups or in individuals' homes. And this is a bit of work that is shifting the balance of care away from specialist services and podiatry, um, and is a ve has been very well welcomed in the locality also. Under the strategic priority of working together with communities, um, we continue to, to develop around our men's shed. Um, many of you will be aware of these projects that are already underway in different areas. Our Aberfeldy project has been started as part of our Aberfeldy model of care, and that is currently underway with the, with the men's shed being built as we speak. Other community projects, we're working with the Rattray Rat Community, um, Scottish Youth Football Project, and this has been supported by our community engagement workers. And this is looking at uh, how we can actually work together in a more integrated way with the youth around um, the Scottish Football Association. So that's a very positive bit of work. Another pilot scheme that's just commenced in the Strathmore area is to assist complex families um, who have difficulty accessing services. This um, group has actually been led by Police Scotland and the aim is to save and improve lives while reducing what might be often considered high demand from these service users. So this is a team that's formed, being led by Police Scotland, but supported by housing, public health, education, social work, mental health services and housing, um, Scottish Ambulance Service and, and, and voluntary PCAVs. Um, and this is expected to be a, a very productive piece of work in terms of how we might reduce dependency on substances, alcohol, misuse. Um, and risk of harm and suicide for that um, client group. We're also about to start a piece of work around resilient communities in North Perthshire, which is a feasibility study um, looking at older people in the locality and how we can work jointly with volunteers um, under the Dina Hond steering group, um, primarily focused on the health services and the aspects of that at the moment. Um, compassionate Communities is another area of work which is developing and many of you will have heard about that already. Um, we're looking to develop links across the localities and co-produce with um, communities, voluntary groups, um, linking intergenerational support where we can, food banks and other wider groups. Um, we're also supporting staff to become involved in um, some national work at a Scottish level, which is in the in International Foundation of Integrated Care Action Learning Programme. So we have put some staff forward for that, which again will um, help enhance um, the locality development in terms of com compassionate communities. Reducing inequalities, our work continues um, in terms of how we use the locality profile information that's been developed through our business improvement teams. Um, some of this will be addressed using the technologies that I've already described. Um, we'll have local volunteer groups continue to support transport and we'll continue to work with the local action partnership um, within Highland, which is, um, has a work stream health and wellbeing, which is chaired by a local councillor. Um, and that was looking at how we can improve pro approaches to managing social isolation and loneliness. Making the best use of available facilities, people and resources. We have a focus on healthy working lives um, in the North locality. We are currently maintaining our gold award for healthy working lives and we will be rolling out to the teams that are not included in that, working towards a bronze award. We continue to work, have a workforce review and some of that's been mentioned in the wider strategic workforce plans this morning. And um, from a North locality perspective, um, We'll be beginning um, our workforce tool planning over the next few months for all teams um, and how we will link with um, housing and considering other types of roles within the localities. So how we might look at generic workers, different models of care and, and using the co-op and connections to our community groups um, to develop our workforce planning going forward. Um, and just the final section, keeping people safe. So um, in terms of our adult support and protection, 
Um, we will work, we work in the locality to make sure that all the teams are up to date in terms of adult support and protection agenda, um, guidance, good practice and training is in place, um, and we're currently supporting the preparation for an up and coming inspection. Team leaders across the localities are involved in the leadership team focusing on ensuring um, adult support and protection improvements around that. From a health perspective, we're very much focused on infection control um, and safety around um, our as part of our HIST walkthrough inspections and we're currently testing the seven steps inspection which really is just a, a way of getting our first sort of steps, um, a first impression if you like of, of the areas that are currently being expected, inspected rather. And I think that's probably all I need to say, that's a whistle stop <laughs> tour of my two years of my life. <laughs> Thank you very much for that um, very comprehensive um, report. Um, it is very useful to hear about the, all of the, the things that you're, you're doing um, in the North locality. And I think also, um, given that we have uh, two members, I think at least two members uh, from the North locality, <laughs> uh, from the North locality, um, that there might be some questions on that. Um, I have a couple and for Chief Officer as well, but uh, if who wants to go first? Councillor Duff. That was just to, to thank Amanda for that very um, um, comprehensive report. Um, there's a lot happening uh, in the, the North locality and um, I was very um, uh, encouraged to see the kind of breadth and, and the, 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 the spread of, of um, activity that's going on within it as, as we all heard there. Um, as we know, um, access to services in, in Rannoch and Aberfeld area in particular were recently um, highlighted as, as being, I think it was the either lowest or one of the lowest scores in terms of the Scottish index of uh, multiple deprivation in terms of access to service and, and transport to get to things is, is quite a, a difficulty in, in our particular area uh, and that's why um, I very much support what's happened with the Aberfeldy model of care and the clinics and the services that we're trying to, to bring uh, into the area for, for people and in, in particular I'm quite keen to get the video conferencing uh, aspect of uh, consultations up and running so that people don't have to travel the I can't remember what it is, 50 odd miles to nine wells or, or 30 odd miles to, to Pier 95. Okay, um, so uh, you know that that's that's great. I would like to hear a wee bit more about social prescribing. You mentioned that in your uh, thing. I was just wondering, just if you give us an idea of what that involves. Thank you. Um, our social prescribing model is really focused around the GP practice and whether we can um, defer, I suppose, some of the work away from GP. So for patients going directly to the GP, our social prescribers are working around the team to signpost people to the most appropriate place and supporting people to get there, if that makes sense. Um, I think it's been received very well in the North locality and the GPs are starting to shift the balance, I think, in terms of how they might use that resource in a more constructive way. And I think it fits with all the other changes that are happening around the GP contract and GP practice as well. So. It is shifting the balance away. I think people are feeling more supported. Um, there is current work going on to evaluate um, the model and what the model will look like going forward for the North and for the wider Celticum West. Thank you. Now, has your question already been asked? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, it is in relation to social prescribing, and this is something that obviously it is an, um, an excellent way forward, but um, what has come up through our recent carers strategy group, that we acknowledge that uh, social prescribers are not available in all GP practices for various reasons, but some time back um, there had been an agreement that there would be some... Um, information cards um, uh, put together which could be available in all GP surgeries um, and it would either be for the GP themselves to um, direct the patient um, to that service or available um, for just um, in the surgery itself. 
Now, I think that there seems to have been some confusion in relation to this having been taken forward. And at our last um, care of strategy group, they are looking into that. Um, but for, I, I suppose, my point of view, um, it seems a very easy way of um, directing patients to other support services. And I hope that it is something that will um, be taken forward and, and seems very um, uh, a good opportunity for across the whole of Perth and Ross. Thank you. Um, I, just in a, as a response to the question, I have seen information cards at a locality level, but I will go back and make sure that they are um, as available as they should be, and I'm happy to share them with some of you if that would be helpful as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Benson. Um, thank you very much indeed, Amanda. It's quite um, comprehensive, the different initiatives that are within um, the, the work you're doing across the North um, locality. And I suppose a lot of us would say, hallelujah, it's long overdue that, that we finally got to this stage. But it, it does, um, but it's also been paralleled by quite a lot of shared um, working across all of the different agencies to get to this point, um, whether it's about um, community safety um, partnership initiatives, action partnership initiatives, and it, it requires that level of hiking up to inform people that they are part of this process and they need to feed into it. It's very much a community development approach, I would describe as really what social work really does bring. It really does have the expertise um, in, in this area. Um, so I, I greatly welcome these step forwards, but we're still, um, the big issue now for us is about digitalization and how we can really transform it exactly. So even though the benefits are going to your local um, GP surgery, which is still limited in some cases actually because they don't have the, the technology, is the importance of actually having um, digitalization you can do from your living room. And there are lots of good examples um, already around about where that's already happening. So the opportunity here is absolutely immense. It would transform um, not only the, the time it takes to deliver services, make everyone much more efficient and cut down on rather a lot of pollution as well. So I welcome that. I'm also wondering, given that the, the chair of the integrated Integration Joint Board has indicated he'd quite like to have, be, have one IJB meeting out with Perth, and he, I think Brad Alvin was something that was voiced. And I'm thinking that what you're talking about would be an excellent thing to do to share just what's happening there. Um, and uh, I, I really do appreciate it, but we have a long way to go. We need to max these surgeries and other facilities as, as best we can. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr. Benson. And just in addition to that, um, my question was going to be, my first question was going to be on uh, technology-enabled care as well. And there was quite a significant discussion about um, technology and the better use of it um, at the most recent integration joint board. Um, so it was just to ask, um, obviously, some of the things you were talking about in terms of the uh, in texting blood pressures and um, the, the video conferencing um, are quite exciting and I think that's what Mr. Benson has also alluded to in terms of cutting out um, that time needed to either go a resident to go to an appointment or for someone to go and visit the, the, the local resident. I'm just wondering in terms of the, the time scales for implementing some of those things um, and also the, the resourcing of that. Obviously in an ideal world, you know, more resources means we can do things quicker. But um, given the, the, the more pressing need, I suppose, in somewhere like the North locality, do you feel you have the, the appropriate resources in place to progress that within a timely fashion? Thank you, Chair. In terms of our Aberfeldon model, we're already set up to go with the NHS near me um, technology, so the, the IT equipment has been fitted. Um, the bit we're beginning to work on now is how the teams will actually start to use um, and which patient groups will identify um, first. So from a locality perspective, and not just from the Aberfeldy perspective, we're already d in discussions with um, our senior charge nurses at a community hospital level who are linking with specialist nurses who are already using this video technology. So really getting this working bit better is a hearts and minds. It, it's really getting people to think differently about how they currently work. Um, the equipment is there, as we've said, at the Aberfeldy and at community hospital level, it's all there for people to use. Um, 
the way we've described this model in Aberfeldy is to actually to help people and patients in the locality to think about things in a different way as well because there's a bit of a hearts and minds there about people not having to drive to nine miles or not having to live, although that's slightly different in the Aberfeldy area because there probably be a benefit to that. Um, so the equipment is there and, and the idea is that we will bring people into Aberfeldy or Pitlochry to use the video technology with a view that once people are confident and competent using it that they can just do it from their living room. Again, in the North locality, that relies more on um, you know, internet connections and how that will function going forward. So the equipment's there. It really, it's a culture change that we're, we're working with. It takes time, as you know, to, to embed that culture. So over the next um, six months to a year, we'll be working in the North locality to start to get teams to think differently. We're already trying to get teams to think differently about how we deliver training. Um, it is becoming more complex to release staff from um, clinical areas. So thinking about how they could use that technology in a different way, how they can actually not attend meetings, they can actually dial into meetings. So we're just trying to test that infrastructure um, going forward. So that's probably where we are. So we just need to keep going, I think. Okay, thank you. That's very encouraging. Um, I also wanted to ask about, um, you spoke uh, about your engagement with community organisations and community groups, and you also touched um, about the uh, health and care, uh, health and wellbeing cooperative in Highland Pasha. Um, and I've met with them before, and I'm certainly very encouraged by the, the, the work that they are doing, um, particularly um, in light of some of the comments that have been made by the Chief Officer um, previously about the, the difficulty, particularly in the more rural areas, of, of getting um, private provision. Um, I suppose my, my question is, there is some reluctance sometimes um, I've, I've heard from um, other people and, and from officers as well for um, local residents and the people who are in need of care um, to take that leap to, to using a, a cooperative model um, rather than the, the, the uh, council or the, the health and social care partnership actually choosing that and delivering that for them, even if it is delivered through a private provision. So I'm just wondering what steps have you taken to try and um, help people to take that step to move towards um, using a cooperative model where it might be the best um, option for them? Thank you. Um, we've had recent meetings actually with the, the co-op in, in, in Aberfeld in the north um, to how they might actually integrate into our locality model. So thinking about our Aberfeld um, service um, and actually how we make um, them part of a, one of our partners rather than a very sort of separate issue. Um, and I think that's where we need to keep going in terms of care cooperatives and working as wider partners across health and care but also the, the private agencies that are working in the areas as well. I think with the challenges we have around recruitment and the challenges we have around um, being able to deliver services, we have to work in that way going forward, especially in the very north um, area. So I think some of these relationships are established. I think there's more work that needs to be done to keep that um, going forward. And I suppose our ambition is that, that we would be seen as a much more collective um, resource um, going forward. Okay, thank you. That's that's very encouraging. Chief Officer. Thank you. I, I mean, I don't want to interrupt the flow because I think probably what we're experiencing here is, is, is a real interest in some of the work that's going on in the ground and the difference that we're trying to make. And I, I, I'm really grateful to Amanda for, for providing that. I suppose the questions that are coming... Uh, well, so one of the things I was thinking about is actually how do we ensure that that sort of information is, is more effectively shared? And this might come back to, to Mr. Benson's comments about communication. But then I'm also thinking about, you know, the roles and responsibility of an audit and performance committee uh, and, and the extent to which we can provide this committee with what it needs to be assured and, and, and apply governance. So there's something there about how we Perhaps, I, I'm thinking, and this is maybe just off, you know, off the top of my head, so bear with me, whether we should perhaps be having development sessions where we're doing more presentations on the work that we are doing so that IGB members are better cited on that rather than necessarily in a formal committee, but, 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 but that's for, for you as members to determine. And I'm thinking also that that lends itself to perhaps potentially also addressing one of the outstanding recommendations from the Joint Inspection Report, and that's about... How do we ensure that the work that the partnership is delivering in communities is also something that's understood by Perth and Kinross councillors who are not on the IGB? Um, and maybe NHS board members who are, who are not on the IGB. 
Uh, and I think maybe what we should be doing is thinking about framing some sort of event around the launch of our strategic commissioning plan and the work that we're doing in localities, which would perhaps be a useful uh, segue into social prescribing and public health and, and having a half day with, with a wider audience. So we can perhaps discuss that offline. Um, the other, I suppose, uh, more direct point, I, suppose I would suggest for, for, for the committee is, is what might we provide you further in relation to performance information? How, how would you like to be hearing about the types of work that's going on in, in, in localities with, with a greater focus on, on performance? Um, certainly the performance report that we referenced earlier can be disaggregated down to localities. It perhaps doesn't provide the richness of what you've just experienced in terms of thinking at actually what's going on uh, locally. And whether or not actually that, that's necessary in terms of data and statistics and, 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 and measures relative to um, more qualitative feedback on, on how we are trying to work more effectively with communities and, and with local citizens. So just some points and comment for consideration. Thank you, Chief Officer. Mr. Benson. Um, thank you very much. It's had a good hearing. I think there's one key issue that um, is... Uh, because we're really working hard on it, it's around housing, and it's, it's finding the appropriate housing for many people who are on that threshold of needing more care. And um, my experience of speaking to many people is that um, they are unable to downsize um, from um, larger homes into homes that they can sustain. And for many people who, who live in rural areas, uh, affordable housing is not an option for them. So living in the commercial rented world, which is quite significant when you're dealing with people on fixed incomes. So there's quite a big issue for me in terms of the, the work we could be doing in terms of our own performance, in terms of what could we do with the, our existing housing stock in the areas to um, make them more usable um, and affordable for many people in that area um, because that is the number one issue because um, the, other one the other issue is that if you cannot make this work for you, there aren't, there's more than care implications about coming into either hospital or social care. There's implications about having to leave the area full stop and that can be a, a death sentence for many older people in fact in terms of having to leave their, their communities entirely and all of their support networks. It's a massive issue, and I would like us to, and I think Gordon has referred to this before when he was talking to Scottish government officials about the importance of housing and, and providing it. And now there are obviously well-known adult groups that require that kind of housing, but also I think across the piece, and I think it's one that um, um, we would all welcome as a further discussion on the need for affordable, um, accessible housing um, that would help us to support people through our service delivery uh, more effectively. Thank you for that um, comment. One final point that I was just going to raise, and it was briefly mentioned at the start of your presentation, but perhaps is more a question for the, the Chief Officer, was about the, the fact that the North locality has Cars of Gowrie for um, adult social work, whereas, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the South locality that has it for health, is that correct? I just think that, it, to me, that just seems a very strange thing that runs against the principles of integration. At first, I suppose, I'm wondering how that works in practice, and then secondly, um, is that something that we should look at reviewing? Can, can we do the second bit first? Okay. Be because um, I, I only learned that today, mea culpa. Uh, I, I hadn't understood that there was that, that um, divergence in relation to the, the, the arrangements, so it, it, it probably is a historical and a, a, an issue that, that, that Amanda may be able to comment on, but equally, yes, if we are serious about integration, we need to make sure that we're, we're, we're trying to create that sort of integrated approach in, in, in terms of you know, coterminosity. I think the first time I learned about it was from maps. Um, because one map had Karsagari in it and one map, di uh, one map didn't, and there was a dispute about whether it should or not, and I think that uh, illustrated the, the, the problem. But, um, Amanda, if you wanted to comment on how it works in practice or, or not. Is it Thank you. Um, well, I think the first is to assure you it does work in practice, but it means the teams have to work across different boundaries. 
Now, currently, we, so between the locality managers and the service managers, we've done a significant bit of work around our boundaries already in terms of because the none of them are aligned, so there was no alignment between um, even the health boundaries, between community nursing, mm -hmm. uh, community mental health teams. Uh, so, so we've done a bit of work there already, which is aligned with our social work uh, colleagues as well. There has been work um, taken forward in terms of that Carsey Gowdy sitting in north for social work and, and in south for health and how that might look going forward. And there is a resource transfer discussion ongoing um, as we speak. Um, which will align that. I think there's further discussion around in terms of where the GP clusters sit as well. There's also further work in terms of where the Highland Action Partnerships and the council wards, which can see us at further. So um, it is a challenging situation that we work across um, and patients are never caught um, on a boundary um, dispute, if you like, um, and we take a very common sense approach to how we um, manage people that might not fit into a space um, normal locality. But it, is, it does make it more challenging in terms of the work that the other folk run here, if that assures you. <laughs> Thank you. Perhaps something we can have a, an update on in, in future. Are there any further questions um, on, the, on the presentation? Well, given that the, the chief officer has just become aware of it today, maybe we have to give him some time to, to well, begin to... I think we should ask the council to change the ward boundaries, actually. <laughs> that would be, that's out with our uh, powers, actually. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you very much for, for that presentation. That was that was really valuable, um, and I hope that um, members appreciate the that uh, comprehensive report. Okay, um, if we move on now, we have a few items for information only. Um, I'll just run through them. If anyone does have any questions, then feel free to, to um, stop me. But uh, other than that, we'll just uh, note them. Um, so item 6.1, which is the Audit and Performance Committee record of attendance. Oh, <laughs> Mr. Benson. the clerk do we have attendance papers going to the integration joint board itself we, we, we don't we have the, the minute of the meeting and there's the action point update I think my understanding um, was that this is particularly to do with um, because this is a, an audit committee I, I don't know if Jane wants to come in um, no although I, it, it may be best practice from a kind of general governance perspective um, rather than for particularly for audit performance so I think it probably um, you know in response to Bob's point probably does provide a level of additional helpful information um, in relation to the issue of proxies I had noticed um, actually um, the accuracy of the list we need to update for the fact that Norman did provide um, proxy and Maureen um, which is not actually noted um, in the um, current record of attendance so we do need to correct that so I, I, I think it's important and, and, and I certainly would think it would be something the IGB may wish to, wish to consider. That's certainly something we can we can look into Mr Benson. Chief Officer. No I was just going to say that, that I, I think that would be helpful and I think we all we are we're all holding out hope that we have um, finally achieved a degree of stability around our membership that, that may mean that um, that's less of an issue, but certainly something that I is worth reflecting on because I was similarly to colleagues writing down that, you know, Bob, Peter and John are here, but they're not um, recognised as having been members previously. So, uh, and, and in various, here in various capacities. So we need to, we need to look at that, yes. Thank you, okay. Um, so we're happy to note uh, that with those comments from, from Mr. Benson. Um, item 6.2, um, the Perth and Kinross Council Best Value Assurance Report. 
happy to note that. Um, item 6.3, the Audit um, and Performance Committee Work Plan for 2018-19. Chief Financial Officer. Um, I would just like to say that we'll be providing a full um, review and update um, and be bringing forward the next forward plan to the, to the June meeting. Um, that will reflect um, lessons learned um, and further work we're taking forward. For example, the need to bring forward regularly the audit fee, um, etc. So we'll be doing that for the next meeting. Thank you. Item 6.4, the annual audit report 2018-19. Any questions on that? No? Happy to note it. Um, and finally, item 6.5, which is the uh, future dates um, of the Audit and Performance Committee. Okay. Um, thank you very much for um, your attendance today. Um, can I ask if um, members want to raise anything with um, either the, the Chief Internal Auditor or the External Auditors um, in private? Uh, I would then ask the, the officers to leave for, is everyone okay? No? Okay, right, thank you very much. And um, that concludes the Audit and Performance Committee meeting today. Thank you.